So NETS provide a really useful service. They allow you to share an IP address among many hosts, which is useful, useful today given uh, that IP addresses are becoming more scarce. They also can provide some other uh, useful services, such as a limited degree of security and firewalling. So there are a lot of implications to what happens when you're behind the net. So this video is going to go into what some of those implications are and how some modern applications today try to deal with them when they're obstructions. So the first implication with applications of a network address translator is that, generally speaking, uh, incoming connections, uh, you can't have an incoming connection. So we saw this back when we talked about Skype. What happens is when you want to open a call with somebody who's behind a NAT, you can't directly open a TCP connection to them because there's no mapping. Um, so let's walk through how that works. So here we have uh, an SSH server, uh, or we have a server sitting behind a NAT. Here's server A. Um, and it has it happens to be running an SSH server on port 22. And it has you know opened a connection to this server S. It's browsing the web. You know, it does a web connection. This is great. So now, what happens when host B wants to open an SSH connection to host A? Well, the problem is, it's going to be sending a packet to this NAT. And whatever happens, somehow this packet needs to be translated to be going to 10.0.0.101 port 22. But there's no mapping for that. SSH is a server. Uh, it doesn't issue connection requests out, it receives connection requests. And so the NAT has no mapping. And so because there's no mapping to 10.0.0.101 port 22, B effectively can't open an SSH connection. Right? The NAT allows connections out, it does not allow connections in. And so this poses uh, all kinds of complications for applications where you know, what happens if, say, I'm running Skype and I would like to make a phone call if the other node's behind the NAT? I can't open a connection to that node. Um, and so it really restricts the kinds of services that you can deploy. And you have to jump through a bunch of hoops in order to make applications work when they're sitting behind NATs. But so this is the number one implication of sitting behind a NAT to an application, which is that essentially if you're behind a NAT, generally speaking, other nodes, unless you coordinate very carefully, and I'll show some ways you can do it, you can't open, nobody can open a connection to you. So the first approach, and I talked about this briefly uh, in the Skype lecture before, is something called connection reversal. So imagine that A is sitting behind a NAT, and B wants to open a connection to A. Well, B can't, because the NAT has no mapping, these packets will bounce off, you know, bounce off you get ICMP errors. And so what you can do is have some kind of reversal service or some kind of rendezvous service where both A and B are connected to the rendezvous service. And when B wants to open a connection to A, what it actually sends is it sends a request, hey, A, I want a connection. The rendezvous service can forward this request on. Then A can open a connection to B. So this is called connection reversal because B wants to open a connection to A, but because it can't because of the NAT. So instead, you reverse the connection, have A open a connection to B. And to do this, you need some kind of rendezvous service the two can communicate, but they both open outgoing connections to the rendezvous service, and then uh, requests are forwarded in that way. So this is, for example, one of the things that Skype does. So another approach, and this is also some, this is also what Skype does, is if both hosts are behind a NAT, well, this means that neither of them can directly open a connection to the other. In both cases, the connection request will fail. There's no mapping on the NAT, generally speaking, and so it fails. So instead, what you do is you have both of them connect to some relay R. And then the relay R forwards traffic between those two connections. So data that streams in from A's connection that R receives, then forwards to the connection to B. Data that comes in from B's connection, R receives and forwards to A. But here's this example of suddenly this is no longer end-to-end. -end. We now have introduced this additional host in the center, and who knows what could go wrong. Um, so certainly if you're doing this, it's good to uh, encrypt your traffic, unless you trust the relay. But there's a way where if both hosts are behind a NAT, they can still open connections to one another. Admittedly, through a third host that is that does have a publicly routable IP address, and which is not sitting behind a NAT. 
So that's sort of some basic things that you can just see at the TCP level and et cetera. It turns out that if you really need to open up direct connections, there are uh, more sort of aggressive um, and tricky things you can do, one of which is called uh, NAT hole punching. And so the basic idea here is that we have these two clients that are sitting behind NATs, client A and client B, and they want to open up direct connections to one another, or a direct connection between each other. They don't want to go through some external rendezvous service or relay. And so what they do is they first talk with some external server to figure out what, you know, some say the server here, to figure out what their external address and ports are. So client B says, aha, if I send you packets, say, from UDP port uh, 6000, the server will then report back with the message saying, aha, well, these packets you're sending, I see them coming from 76, 18, 117, 20, uh, port uh, 9091. So the client B knows that 10.1.1.9, port 6000, appears externally to the world as 76, 18, 17, 20, 9091. And A does the same thing. So it'll find out that you know, its uh, packets look like 34.22.8, uh, uh, port uh, 30,005. So now, in these cases, both clients A and B have sent packets over the NAT from this internal address port pair to, this ex to an external uh, IP address uh, on port. And the NATs have created mappings. So they have mappings internally for this internal address uh, port. And let's just say that they're full cone NATs, just for simplicity's sake. So this means that these mappings are now active on the NATs. And so it's possible now if communicating with the server, client B can ask the server, hey, what's client A's public IP address and port? Based on that, the server could say, ah, oh, well, it's 128.34.22.8, you know, port 30,005. Ah, then client B could send traffic to that uh, public IP address and port pair, and it could traverse the NAT mapping. Similarly, A could ask the server, hey, what's B's IP public IP address and port pair? Then send traffic to 76, 18, 17, 20, port 9091, and have it traverse the mapping and go to client B. This is assuming that those mappings are full cone. These are full cone nets. Let's say that they're not full cone nets. Well, it turns out you can still do some tricks where the server um, can tell client A and client B again what the public IP address port pairs are of the other clients. And then the clients can try sending traffic to each other simultaneously. And so client B will start sending traffic to uh, 128.34.22.8 port 3005 from its port 6000. Simultaneously client A will start sending traffic to 76.18.17.20 port 90.91 from its uh, IP address and port. And what's going to happen is that if we say had a restricted cone NAT or even a port restricted NAT, when those packets, those pa outgoing packets traverse the NAT, the NAT's going to set up a mapping. It's going to say, aha, I see that you, client A, are sending traffic to this external IP address and port. I'll create a mapping for you so things are translated properly. Similarly, this NAT on the right, it's going to do when client B sends the traffic. And so by knowing what the external address and ports are of the other side, they can force the NAT to set up a mapping. So one question is, is there a kind of NAT, or what kinds of NATs would this not work for? This model where client A and client B simultaneously send traffic to the external IP address and port that map to an internal IP address and port on each of these clients, which were determined earlier by communicating with the server. So given we have these different kinds of NATs, is there a kind of NAT for which this would not work? So it turns out this will work for full cone NATs, because the mappings will work fine even if the, the source IP address and port are different. Work for uh, restricted cone NATs, because again, we've set up these mappings, which will include the external IP address of the other NAT. Um, it'll work for port restricted NATs, because again, these packets can be coming from the right UDP ports. The one class of NAT it won't work for is a symmetric NAT, because when these clients talk to the server to figure out their IP address and port, their external ones, that mapping won't hold when they start talking to another NAT. 
So just because the server saw port 30,005, when client A then tries to send traffic to uh, the NAT on the right, the, the, uh, the NAT is not going to reuse port 30,005. It's going to allocate a new external port, and so it won't work. So this is one reason why symmetric NATs are really frowned upon in the internet today. So we talked about implications of NATs to applications and how they have to uh, do things to set up mappings or either use relays or um, rendezvous services. So there's another perhaps even deeper implication of NATs, uh, which is to transport. So if you think for a second, for a NAT to set up a mapping, it needs to know what the transport uh, protocol is. It needs to know the transport protocol's headers. So for example, when it sets up a UDP or a TCP mapping, the NAT needs to know that this is a TCP segment, this is a UDP segment, this is where the port number is in that segment, this is what I need to rewrite. This is how checksums are calculated. Um, and without that, it can't do it. So if you deploy, if you say write a new transport protocol that uses a transport protocol identifier um, in an IP packet, uh, and you try to get it to traverse a NAT, a NAT will discard it. It doesn't know the packet format. And so in this way, you can't really deploy a new transport protocol on the internet today. Sort of, there's a chicken and egg problem where the people developing NAT software and maintaining the NAT software will not add support for a new transport protocol until it's very, very popular. But it won't become very popular until it works across NATs. And so there's this sort of this debate and philosophical discussion, right, in sort of the early, uh, you know, mid-2000s about how NATs mean that we're basically stuck with TCP, UDP, and ICMP, right? To have a, an application work for real on the internet at large, it has to use one of those three transport protocols. And so really, with NATs today, we're not going to see any new transport protocols on the internet. And so this leads to this really big philosophical debate that was especially occurring as NATs deployed in the early 2000s about, on one hand, NATs are astoundingly useful. You can reuse addresses. There's security. You know, if I'm sitting behind a NAT and I happen to have some vulnerable open port, say, on my Linux machine or my Windows machine, since there's no mapping, attackers from outside on the broad internet can't, uh, can't compromise me. Right? It sort of gives this very simple, I mean, very sledgehammery, but but very effective just for end users, uh, security, right? Not opening connections can be good. But there's also they're also tremendously painful, especially before NATs started to have standard behavior. De developing applications is really hard. Imagine if somebody calls you and says, hey, your application doesn't work. You know, sometimes the connection drops. And it could be something like it happens to be that it's when their client is transitioning from one server to another, and the NAT is using a symmetric is a symmetric uh, NAT such that you know, the ports are being uh, reallocated and the connection breaks. Uh, really hard to debug. Um, and so one example, there's this really uh, famous example of something called Speak Freely, which is this pre-Skype voice over IP. Um, and basically, the guy said, hey, uh, I'm going to stop developing Speak Freely because, you know, it just doesn't work under NATs, and there's no way to make them work with NATs. This is before people figured out all the hole punching and before the behavior was standard enough to do so. And so there's this huge philosophical debate. NATs good, NATs bad. They break the end-to-end -end argument. Um, but really, it's really it's very interesting, but it turns to be pointless. I mean, NATs are here to stay. They're deployed. They'll always be deployed. Their advantages generally are considered to outweigh uh, the disadvantages. People are going to deploy them, and they want them to work, and you have to work around them. But so what this means is that we you know, sort of historically talk about the internet as having a narrow waist at IP. There's a single unifying protocol, which then allows you to have many transport protocols above, many link protocols below. But NATs have changed that. And so really, in a practical sense, the new hourglass includes not only layer 3, but also layer 4. Because for practical concerns, we're not going to see new transport protocols uh, implemented or deployed. You can build protocols on top of UDP, and that's generally what's done today. Since UDP just provides a nice datagram service, rather than using a transport identifier at three, at layer three, you use a port uh, at, at layer four. Um, but this is the world uh, as it is, that now the new hourglass of the internet, because of network address translation, is IP, then with ICMP, TCP, and UDP. So you can see how this technology actually has caused an architectural shift within the internet within the past decade.